Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Please view our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or app. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Christos anesti. Christos anesti. Christus resurrexit. Sigur dixit. Dr. Pepino, such a blessing to have you back with us. This is going to be a lively discussion tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to it. The mic's all yours. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be back with you. It's our last evening together. And tonight we're going to look at the smallest number of councils we'll have looked at. It's nearly as though we're shrinking with eight to four. And tonight we're going to look at two councils, and they have the same first name, Vatican. Vatican I and Vatican II. And so we'll look at that now. Vatican II is still controversial because we're so close to it, so we'll try to avoid controversy. Also for tonight, as I promised last time, I have assembled a bibliography, which I am going to I have it right here, but I'll send a copy to Kelsey to put up on the site. It's not an exhaustive uh, bibliography of books. At the end, maybe if I have time, I'll go through the, the, the books. I even have them here so you can see, well, I think I've got them all with me and then some to show you kind of what it's like. And you'll see also the, how complicated the task of the historian can be. Uh, you would think it would be easier to write history closer to our own time than about events that took year, place three million years ago or 3,000 years ago, but it presents challenges of its own. So when I left you last week, I quoted what Vatican once said about Trent. Now, you'll recall that Trent ended in 1563. Vatican I opens in 1869. Three centuries, the longest time, window of time, that the church went without an ecumenical council. So I guess it was time. But in the meantime, three centuries, a lot has changed. So quick, broad strokes. What's new about the world in 1869? The biggest thing is that there has been a French Revolution in 1789. And on the continent in 1848, there's going to be a bunch of attempted revolutions in various countries, particularly Germany, Italy, and France again. And it means there's also been Napoleon who's been spreading the ideas of the French Revolution wherever he went. So we have a new world in which we no longer have absolute Catholic monarchs as we did in the days between Trent and the French Revolution, which means we no longer have the alliance between the altar and the throne. And also, and so church and state relations have changed in fact. So for example, we no longer have by 1869, prince archbishops who elect the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, a lot of things has, many things have changed from that point of view. And monastically, the French Revolution destroyed a lot of, of monasteries, including Cluny, the Cluniacs, one of the glories of the Middle Ages. That monastery has been destroyed. It's in ruins. And in German, Reichenau. So that's the negative aspect of things, positive aspect. An astounding revival of the faith in the 19th century after the disaster of the revolutions, in part in reaction to these disasters. Think of the Cure of Ars, St. John Mary Vianney. If you read his stories, this 
huge book, which I recommend, you can see in his own life, he goes from being a seminarian during the Napoleonic era with the difficulties to going into the countryside where there's not much faith, to having been able to restore the faith to, to an entire region. That sort of thing is going on all over Europe, although in an unsung way. This is the century of Saint Thérèse de Lisieux and many others. I can't go into all the saints of this time. New religious congregations are being founded all over the place, many of them with a missionary charism, because at the same time also the faith is spreading all over the world, particularly Africa, Asia. So we have a strong and vigorous society, uh, uh, church and faith going on too. Catholic thinkers in the 19th century that lay, to some extent, we might say the groundwork for Vatican I. In the early part of the 19th century, French thinkers particularly are focusing increasingly on Rome and the Vatican and the Pope as the lodestar of the faith. Until then, in France especially, but also Germany, Austria, Hungary, the churches had been on an independent track. Yes, the Pope in Rome, fine, but they had their own often liturgies, customs, and even some dodgy doctrines, especially in France. It was called Gallicanism. And Gallicanism is essentially, it nearly sounds like Anglicanism except for Gaul, for France, right? And there's a good reason for that the notion that France really should, should be able to mind her own affairs. Certainly the king, I beg your pardon, certainly the Pope should not be able to pick bishops for France. And Gallicanism also had some conciliarism left over. So in reaction to that, we have a movement that is called, it's the opposite movement called ultramontanism. It's from the Latin ultramontes, beyond the mountains. So from a French, or Northern European perspective, on the other side of the Alps, which is where Rome is. La Monet, or Abigail De Mestre, Chateaubriand, and others are increasingly advocating for greater rights for the Pope. Even they're articulating the infallibility of the Pope in all matters, the absolute obedience that all Christians should have directly to the Pope himself, that's, that's the intellectual ferment in one sector of the church in France and also into Germany and Belgium. Now, the Pope who's going to call this Vatican I Council is Pope Pius IX. And Pius uh, IX will be Pope from 1846 to 1878. So as you can see, it's a long papacy, and it completely encompasses Vatican I, which only is a two-year council. And he started out being in favor of some of the modern uh, progressive ideas in society, but the revolution of 1848, which took place two years into his pontificate, he realized that revolutionaries were going to be anti-church, and that gave him a fright, and then he switched sides to being anti-modern anti-progressive, anti-liberal. And it is to him that we owe the syllabus of errors, which was against what he considered to be the great errors of the modern era, including freedom of conscience, that, you should be, that people should be able to preach falsehood. He, he, he said, no, that's an error. You, you can't have that. Freedom of the press, he's against it, because the press is the means, if, if it's completely free, Wicked men can disseminate wickedness and falsehood through the papers. So he's against that and other things besides. And this was in 1864. And now we get to 1869. Now, the safety this entire time, the safety of Rome has been guaranteed by the presence of French soldiers who are there on orders from Napoleon III, who's a devout Catholic because revolution is still brewing in Italy. And the House of Savoy, this is the kingdom of Savoy, Piedmont, that whole area in northern Italy, is being pushed by these revolutionaries, including Garibaldi and others, to reu reunite Italy 
into one single country, which necessitates the invasion of the papal states and the taking of Rome from the Pope. The French soldiers are there to keep this from happening. This is important for the rest of the story. So here's Pius IX, and one of his cardinals says that there is one Protestant error that Trent three centuries ago had not completely dealt with, and that was the actual nature of the church herself and her hierarchical constitution. He says it would be a good idea to, to somehow finish the work of Trent regarding what the church is and how the church is organized hierarchically. Because some errors like Gallicanism and conciliarism were still around. And one of the teachings of the Gallicans was that the Pope is infallible, yes, but only if he receives the assent of the church when promulgating a doctrine, right? So he's not of himself infallible. He would need the church to rubber stamp his decisions. And furthermore, another uh, man in the entourage of the Pope said, it's been too long since the last council, we need one. And the Bishop of or Orleans in France said, furthermore, it would be a great show for the entire world to see hundreds of bishops gathered around the Pope professing the same faith. It would uh, be very impressive and help with missionary activity and to show the strength of the, of the church was still alive and well, despite all the revolutions and, so, and the persecutions of the revolutions. And so Pope Pius IX he says, okay, let's have a council. And he announced it on the 18th centenary of the martyrdoms of St. Peter and Paul that took place back in 67 AD. And he, he says, we're gonna have a council in 1867. Very meaningful and beautiful date. So it opens on 8th December of 1869, Feast of the Immaculate Conception. It's held in St. Peter's in Rome, hence Vatican I. And it is not a council of reunion, unlike Trent, which invited the Protestants several times only to be rebuffed, unlike Basil, Ferrara, Florence, Unlike Lyon, too, no one outside of the Roman church was present. The Orthodox were invited, but the Patriarch of Constantinople didn't even open the letter. He sent it back to Rome unopened. He said, oh, I know, what, I know what's in here anyway, send it back. So a rebuff from the Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople. The Anglicans were just not invited. And... Pius IX called to Protestants and other non-Catholic Christians to return to the fold. And there was just a storm of refusal as big in all the newspapers and so forth and so on. And by the way, this is going to be the first council of the, tele of the telegraph and newspaper era. So news is going to spread very fast. All the goings on, sometimes the seedy gossip is going to spread through the telegraph wires and be printed in newspapers in London, New York, everywhere. Now, I mentioned ultramontanism in France, and, but there's also a reaction to ultramontanism, particularly from one German theologian called Derlinger. And he wrote anonymously, well, he took the name of Janus, which is the two-faced god of the Romans. And he wrote a lot saying, no, no, the Pope is not infallible to the extent that the ultramontanists say that he is. Well, someone wrote an anti Janus. Tempers are flaring everywhere. And so even the dean of the Sorbonne in Paris says, no, no, neither the papacy nor the bishops as a body, but rather the papacy and the bishops as a body are the depositaries of infallibility. So they have to work together. So we have two sides. There's a third side, those who are willing to admit infallibility of the Pope, but don't think it's the right time to promulgate it because tempers are flying. So the Archbishop of Paris, the Bishop of Orleans, again him, the majority of the German bishops, and even John Henry Newman was what we call an inopportunist. It's, it's true, but not worth promulgating in our generation. And then, but, but most bishops were in favor of infallibility. And we'll get to what that means. But short definition, when the, when the Pope defines uh, matters of faith and morals, he does so 
with the assistance of the Holy Ghost and cannot define error as to promulgate. Okay, we'll get to the full definition in a, in a moment. So the council begins. It was very well prepared. And it had prepared all sorts of things. It had, it had prepared for discussion by the bishops, three dogmatic constitutions, 28 disciplinary and legal or juridical constitutions, 18 constitutions dealing with religious life, one on the Eastern Rites, another one on the missions. But it's not going to get to all of that because of exterior events. It was very well attended. In fact, in those days, there, were, there was about 1,000 bishops in the world. 774 of them are there. 77% of the world episcopate is in Rome. That's huge. So what did the council do? There are two decrees which are dogmatic and promulgate matters of faith and morals. The first one, April 24, 1870, is called Dei Filius. I beg your pardon. That means the Son of God in Latin. And it's on faith. What faith is. Here's the, the brief definition it gives. You can hear the conciliar, precise language. What is faith? It is a supernatural virtue by means of which, with the grace of God inspiring and assisting us, we believe to be true what he, God, has revealed. Not because we perceive its intrinsic truth by the natural light of reason, but because of the authority of God himself. So in other words, faith is the virtue given to us by God by means of which we believe what he has revealed to us, even though our natural, the natural light of our reason has not perceived it. It also discusses the twofold order of knowledge. We know things by, by reason, and when our, our reason cannot go beyond a certain glass ceiling, and there are certain things we only know by faith in revelation. But the main doctrine taught by Vatican I is the infallibility of the Pope. This is what it's known for. And there were some stormy debates. Dollinger is causing trouble. He says, quote, this is Dollinger the German. You see his name there. From the beginning of the church to this day, no one has ever believed in the Pope's infallibility. That's a very strong statement. The Austrian government, this is the Holy Roman Empire, is against the definition. Even the trusted advisor of the Pope, this was Cardinal Antonelli, who was Minister of Finances and a confidant, said, you should probably withdraw this project, Holy Father. I'm not sure it's the right time. The Pius XI, the ninth, I think upon said, I shall go forward. One precedent that looms over the discussions is Honorius I. Those of you who followed the first series of lectures will remember this particular Pope who made a huge boo-boo. He was Pope in the 630s, and he allowed monothelitism, the idea that Christ only had one will, to fester and, and propagate. And remember, Honorius was um, condemned by the Third Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in 680. So people bring out, well, see, a pope can be wrong. And people debate against it. Well, he, he didn't define, anyway, back and forth. So there are speakers, 39 in favor of papal infallibility, 26 against, 40 speakers who don't get to speak because the secretary of the council says, well, we've heard enough. We've heard every possible argument. Only there were some anti-infallibility people among those who were told that you know, there was no use for them to speak. So there was some acrimony there. And we do get to the definition. And they bring up the definition as found in the Council of Basel, Ferrara, Florence, which we saw last week, namely jurisdiction, primacy, the Pope is the teacher of all Christians. And they want to make that more precise. And finally, we get to the definition. And because this is precise, I am going to show you the definition on my screen. Everybody sees it nice and clear? All right. So here's how it says it. We teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma. Okay, in other words, this is from God and it's part of the deposit of revelation. That when the Roman pontiff, that's the Pope of Rome, there's no question, 
speaks ex cathedra. Now, the literal meaning of ex cathedra is from his teaching chair, you might say. But of course, you don't need to have an actual wooden chair for it to work. So they explain what they mean by that. It's a figurative expression. That is, when in the exercise of his office, as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, teacher of all Christians is straight from uh, the Council of Florence. In virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he does what? He defines a doctrine. Any doctrine? No. A doctrine concerning faith or morals that he intends to be held by the whole church. When he does this, he possesses by the divine assistance promised to him in Blessed Peter, so it goes all the way back to Peter, that, infa that infallibility, so he possesses that infallibility by which the re divine Redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith and morals, full stop. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not by the consent of the church, irreformable. Meaning that the Pope, when he defines things in matters of faith and moral, with all these conditions attached, does not need the rubber stamp of a council. That would be conciliarism. The Holy Ghost in, uh, uh, prevents him from teaching error in that moment. So that, as you can see, is a very tight and tidy definition. It does not go as far as many ultramontanists wanted it to go, where they nearly wanted him to be some sort of oracle whose every pronouncement is necessarily true. No, no. It's much more precise than that. And it was approved. There were 555 votes, only two against. So 553 for. Now you may say, well, hang on, didn't you tell me there were 777 bishops? Or, well, where's the balance? Though they're the ones who were against the definition, but they did not want to be undiplomatic or impolite towards the Pope. So they, they, they didn't show up that day. They did not show up to vote. And that's 55 of them. And these, this minority were those who had begged the Pope to cut out what I underlined. You see, that's the one thing they didn't like. But once it was promulgated and ratified by the Pope, nearly all of them said, yes, okay, we accept. With some internal struggle, but they nearly all did. It took what the, the one who took longest to say yes, okay, did so in 1872, so just two years later. And this promulgation, by the way, when the bishops went home, was received with great joy in the US, in the UK, in France. The Germans were more muted. I don't quite know what it is up there beyond the Rhine, but this, I don't know. And the historian Dollinger simply refused it. He said, well, they've created a new church. That's not my church. And he and some other intellectuals found a bishop to start a church of, of their own called the Old Catholics, and they still exist to this day. They have the Old Mass. but They refuse everything. Um, they accept Trent, but not Vatican I, and therefore not Vatican II. So they have the Old Mass all in Latin and so forth. But bizarrely, they ordain women and baptize dogs. So you can see how once, once you're separate from Rome, it goes in all sorts of different directions. Now, I'm not saying Dolligo was in favor of that, but it's just this weird independent church where kind of anything goes now. And just at this point in history, the Franco-Prussian war between Napoleon III and Bismarck breaks out. So the French troops stationed in Rome have to go back to France to defend France against the Prussians, not very effectively, as it turns out, because they lost. And that allowed then the Piedmontese troops, Garibaldi and Cavour and all these men, to take Rome and install a new royal family, the family of Vittor Emanuele and all those people from the House of Savoy and reunite uh, Italy. And from then until 1929, the Pope is going to be a prisoner of the Vatican, and that's kind of it. So a constitution of the whole church was left 
undiscussed. In fact, the only two things really are what I, I mentioned to you. It's a very thin council. The documents don't occupy many pages. Now, I want to speak to you, before we get to Vatican II, about the spirit of Vatican I, because there was one. The Ultramontanists won. Now, the definition is very clear and crisp and precise. Well, the Ultramontanists had won the day, and so they kind of took over everything. And so that it is from Vatican I that Catholics paid a lot more attention to what the trip is, what the Pope is saying, where the Pope is going, what color shoes he's wearing, all those little details. No one cared in 1865, but from Vatican I on, oh, the Pope, the Pope, the Pope. It is also from this period that you, for the first time, get holy cards with pictures of the currently living Pope on them. It was never done before Vatican I. Do you see the shift? A few other changes, then we'll move on. Until then, uh, so a lot of national and regional ca uh, Catholic customs vanish in favor of doing whatever the Romans do. So I mentioned the Cure of Vars earlier today. You know how he had those, the bib, the black bib, you know, like all French priests? From Vatican I on, the younger clergy of France to be Roman start wearing the, just the white Roman collar that we're familiar with today. The pronunciation of Latin, most within, this is a, a couple of generations in, people ditch the regional or national pronunciation of Latin to adopt the Italian Roman way. So just the beginning of the Our Father, Pater Noster Quies in Celis. That's what everybody knows. But in those days, in England uh, and in Ireland, it would, it would be Pater Noster Quies in Celis, as though it were English. Or in French, Pater Noster Quies in Celis. You see? But now, oh, Roman, Roman. Pater Noster Quies in Celis, just like the Italians. All those little things come in after Vatican I. And so the church really concentrates more on Rome now. So you see, you start seeing Peter's, uh, pictures of St. Peter's Basilica everywhere. Anyway, moving on. Now we have to move into the 20th century. Now, after Vatican I, tremendous vitality of the church still. In many ways, the Pope being a prisoner made the church even more vital because the church does best when persecuted, it seems. So then we have World War I terrible hecatomb, and a great deal of despair, too, enters into humanity. How could we do this? What is man that he can do this to himself? Then there's, there's, there's World War II, even worse. And suddenly now what it brings out also is, are we not all brothers? But Nazism had done this. Should we not stop dividing ourselves up into race and denomination? Is there not just one race, which is certainly true, and so ecumenism takes on a different tinge, particularly from all the priests coming back from the camps who had lived great horrors, but also had read, lived a great deal of camaraderie with fellow prisoners from different backgrounds, communists, uh, Jews, and so forth, you see. So the fraternity of man came to be understood outside, if you will, from our fraternity in Christ. Now, let's get to Vatican II. You may have heard that Vatican II came up, that, the, that John XXIII, who's the, the Pope Roncalli, he succeeds to Pius XII in 1958. He's the one with a nice round baby face. Everyone loved him. He was very lovely. You may have heard, oh, like an inspiration out of the blue, he decided to call Vatican II. Not true. Nowhere does he say so himself. And furthermore, there had been uh, projects for a, a council to continue the work of Vatican I. Before, Pius uh, the 11th had thought about it, and uh, his advisor said, no, if you do that, you're going to open a, a can of worms. Pius the 12th also thought he might open the council again, and his advisor said, no, if you do that, who knows what's going to happen. But at the conclave that elected John the 23rd, 1958, two cardinals came to see the future John the 23rd, uh, Roncalli, and this was Cardinals Ottaviani and Ruffini. Ottaviani was the head of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. He's going to be one of the great conservative leaders of, the, of Vatican II. And it is he who went to see the future John XXIII of the conclave to say, Your Eminence, because of course he was only a cardinal, uh, Roncalli at the time, it is necessary to think about a council. 
you may have come to regret that piece of advice. So in other words, it was kind of in the works. And so uh, John the 23rd uh, calls the council. It begins on October 11th, 1962, opened by John the 23rd, and it closes on December 8th, 1965, by the new pope by now, Paul VI. And 16 documents are promulgated. They do get all the work done. It's not like there's an army this time coming in to stop them. And um, I mean, there are the, princip the four central constitutions. In fact, now I'm going to show you the list of documents, okay, just so we can kind of look at all of them together for a minute. Okay. Uh, so there are four constitutions, De Verbum on the Bible, Lumen Gentium, which is uh, both by the David and dogmatic. Lumen Gentium dogmatic is on the church in itself, and also what nearly was a constitution of its own was folded in on Our Lady. Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is actually the first one discussed and promulgated, is a constitution, but it doesn't say dogmatic. It just says dog constitution, and that's on the liturgy. And then here we have Gaudium et Spes, which is a pastoral constitution on the church in its relation to the world. So these are the four constitutions. And then there are three declarations, educating children, nostra etate, relations with non-Christians, important for, the, for um, talking to Jews and Muslims in particular, but also atheists, communists, although it, doesn't, it never says the word communist. And then dignitatus humani on religious freedom. And then there are nine decrees on various things. They're all really disciplinary in nature. So you can, to highlight some of the, those that actually had impact after the council, this one is important because it led to a reform in seminaries. The lay apostolate is something I'll talk about in terms of the good fruits of Vatican II. Otat and Totsius on training priests, seminary, very important too. Perfecte caritatis on renewal of the religious life. We'll talk about that in a moment too. He talks about the return to the sources of Christian life, the original genius, genius of the religious foundation. This is the charism of the founder or the foundress. And, but also accommodation to new circumstances. Its third section says, style of life, prayer, and work of the modern religious should reflect contemporary ideas and living standards. And that is going to, oops, is going to be a big principle in terms of the reforms and changes in religious life after Vatican II. Christus Dominus on Bishop is very important because it is this kind of reflection that led to the establishment of national or regional conferences of bishops. Then there's on ecumenism, the reintegration of unity. And then on Eastern Catholics, this is important too. It's kind of ecumenism, particularly with the Orthodox. And then the runt of the litter, the least read document, is about television. Wow, which was new. And some of these old bishops, for them, it was still a miracle that you could see the man speaking in a box in your living room. So, oh, so they talk about, it, as you can see here. So those are the basic documents, okay. And the count and uh, lots of discussion. No one who was there or alive at the time of Vatican II can forget how meaningful and life-changing it was. So what's interesting about this is I'm going to quote some modern people now, or post-Vatican II people, including Cardinal Francis George. He said, regarding the council, and the circumstance in which it was called, there was no need to re-examine the deposit of faith as councils usually did, but there was need to look at it and find new ways for the church to exercise her mission more effectively. So it's about being more effective for Cardinal George. The Second Vatican Council is therefore a missionary council. It was called not directly to change the church so that she could catch up with the tortured world, but rather to change that world. So that's one opinion. And by the way, opinions of Vatican II are legion. And in a moment, I'm going to talk a little bit about just that aspect of the council, namely, how are 
How is it approached? All right, I'll get to that in a moment. I'll talk about the, the hermeneutics of the council, as it were. So I just mentioned, so Cardinal George, as I just mentioned, well, we had to do something to be more effective, more missionary. Although the church in Africa, if you look at the numbers from 1900 to 1962, it seems it would be difficult to beat those figures. It's just an amazing explosion. So really, when they speak of mission, when Cardinal George here speaks of mission, he's really talking about mission, I think, to de-Christianized Europe. At the time, it was... And I think that was Paul VI Endeavor too. There's an interesting new biography of Paul VI I recommend to you. It's not come out yet in English, but it will soon on Paul VI and his attempts to re-Christianize the Archdiocese of Milan, where he was Archbishop before he was Pope. And you can see some of his principles there. I recommend it, but moving on. So there was a need felt for updating in some quarters. And some of you of a certain age, or who know people of a certain age, will have heard of horror stories of life before the council. I don't know how much of these are true, but the famous anecdote of how even in Australia, the nuns had to change into their summer habits when the rule in Germany specified it, which means they wore their summer habits in the winter in the Southern Hemisphere, and they wore their winter habits in the hot Australian summer, because the rule said April 15th, put on your light habit. And September 15, put on your heavy habit. So that's the kind of thing I humbly, in my opinion, think, okay, we could update that and kind of switch the dates around for the poor women who have to live in the Southern Hemisphere. There was a notion of, in religious life, that nuns and monks were treated like children. They had to beg for stamps and things to send a postcard to their grandmother. Some abuses of authority. I don't think that has ever been fixed because that's human nature, okay? Some antiquated ways of doing things. So, for example, the, the discalced Carmelite men, the rule said you don't wear underwear because it's luxurious in the Middle Ages. So they would sew their drawers into their trousers under their habits. They say, well, I'm just sewing a new lining into my trousers. It's not underwear. That kind of stuff, okay. The liturgical movement before the Council of Two had been moved. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but there were two factions who wanted to do something about the liturgy. One saying, priests have to say mass better and the people have to participate more, sing the glory of the sanctus, say the responses to the priests, so the people will understand the mass better. And part of that movement, of course, is to distribute missiles to the people. There was another minority, vociferous minority, though, since World War II, that said, no, no, the mass is, as it is, is too hard for folks. We need to make the mass simpler. And these two factions are going to, during Vatican II, are going to clash. And then after the council, I think the minority is going to win out. So the interesting thing, though, I showed you the documents there, but before the council began, Ottaviani, remember him? He's the, the, the secretary of the Holy Inquisition. He had had, along with the theological commission before the council, put together all the texts that needed to be adopted and voted on by the bishops, except one on the liturgy, uh, that was La Raona, Cardinal La Raona with his secretary, Anibali Bunini, and specialists, they wrote Sacrosanctum Concilium on the liturgy. So one document on the liturgy by Cardinal La Raona, I think I'm right there, and Bunini, and then all the other ones by the centralized theological commission, made up mainly of priest theology professors at the great pontifical universities in Rome. And of course, the documents they produced were very much in the theological school of Rome, meaning very much based on St. Thomas Aquinas and the kind of theology that had been done from Vatican I until Pius XII. All of those will be scrapped in the first session, except the one on the liturgy. And new commissions are formed to write completely new documents. And that's what is voted on by the bishops. Okay, so there's, there's kind of a coup there at the beginning of the council, but the bishops went along. I mean, the bishops were not, they, they knew what they were doing and they assented to this. Now, I've mentioned factions. We have to be careful. And when I get to the hermeneutics, we'll discuss that a little further. But it certainly is the case that there was a group of bishops, along with their theologians, called by many, I don't think they ever called themselves that, but observers of the council did, the Rhineland group. 
Now, by Rhineland, you mean a group of bishops and their theologians who came from the countries on either bank of the Rhine. So what would that be? Well, it would be, I guess, Switzerland would be in there, France, certainly, Belgium, Germany, and uh, the ne- we can throw in the Netherlands too. And this group was interested in more ecumenical dialogue, a more vigorous liturgical movement. These are the people most traumatized by World War II. You'll notice they're all the countries right there. And the experts are the, these are names you may have heard. If you haven't, I'm not going to go beyond their names, but if you've heard of Hans Kuhn or Edward Schillerbeck, these are the, these were their theological experts who kind of came in their briefcase or suitcase with them. The rest of the world, well, remember the bishops from all over the world, even more than at Vatican I. Third world bishops were there, including Marcel Lefebvre, who represented French speaking Africa outside of the Belgian Congo. Latin American bishops, a lot of them didn't quite, I mean, the Latin Americans and others didn't understand what the fuss was all about. What is this council for? Also, ultramontane reflexes that had, had won the day at Vatican I were still around. So that there were some people who said, What's the point of a council? Now we've got papal infallibility. Couldn't I mean, the Pope could just write down a decree over his morning coffee and mail it out to everyone, and we would know that it's settled doctrine. Well, huh, what do we need this council for? And so John XXIII in Pandora would also to show, yeah, although that's true, and indeed Pius XII had promulgated the dogma of the Assumption of Our Lady, right? So, I mean, the Pope did, could and did go ahead and do such a thing, but he wanted to have the church united around him to make it more visible, and also because in debate and things, you know, you learn things. But another aspect of ultramontanism is that whatever the Pope says goes. And so if you have a Pope like Paul VI, who's a complicated character, both soundly traditional in doctrine on the one hand, his credo of the people of God and humane vitae testify to that, but also but it, from the point of view of discipline, very open. So, for example, he's the one who promulgated the new mass. And in the day he promulgated, said he said, whatever you think of uh, the language of the, of the mass, he said, today we say farewell to Latin, forget it. That was Paul the Sick. And so if the Pope said, today we say farewell to Latin, all the bishops and priests of the world who had been trained in an atmosphere, well, whatever the Pope says, well, that goes, will say, okay, well, that's it then. To say no, to, to say no to the vernacular and the masses to disobey the Pope. I'm not going to do that, whatever I feel. You see? So ultramontanism, so Vatican I explains Vatican II in a, to a great degree as well. Now, the two key buzzwords of Vatican II, and you may have heard these, aggior, I hope I spelled this right, aggiornamento, there it is, and, French word, I know how to spell that, ressourcement. What do these things mean? Adornamento means updating. And it's, it's a clerical, I mean to say like an accountant's word. It's the word you use when you're, you're up, I need to balance my checkbook. That would be adornamento, you know. So bringing things up to date a little bit. And that will be the modernizing aspect of the council and its reforms. Adornamento. So that's one side. On the other side, ressourcement. That means going back to the sources. So in religious life, we saw that going back to the charism of the founder, all right? In liturgy, we'd be going back to, well, whenever you pick, the, uh, the early liturgy, I guess. And in theology, it goes, it often meant going back behind St. Thomas Aquinas to the fathers of the church. So we have these two principles at work. And you can see how, in a way, they're kind of, their intention, because one looks back and the other one looks to the now. A little bit intention and sometimes difficult to puzzle out exactly. But those were the buzzwords. So, for example, for the mass, what do we do? Do we go back to the mass of the second, third, first century? Or do we come up with something for modern man today that he can get? Or a bit of two? Or the latter, meaning make it modern, under the guise of going back to the early days. And there'll be a temptation there to say, well, we don't, much, we don't know enough about the early mass. But we can guess it's pretty much what a 1965 university-going European or American young man would want to have. That's probably what he wanted. And you can see that throughout. Very often when they say, well, we don't know much about what we're going to do, but 
whatever I, Jesuit of 1968, think is pretty neat, that's probably what was going on in the early church. So you'll see some of that. It's kind of a bias. They're blind to it, by the way. And it's, it's kind of bias anyone can have, really, right? I mean, it's like you give your wife a toolbox, you know, oh, she'll love those tools. Think of the things I'll be able to do with them. We, we kind of, you know, look, see ourselves in what we, we give to someone else. Okay. So what does the church look like after this assembly? Well, it looks different. Things look different. Habits are modified, and I'll get back to that in a minute. The mass looks different. The tiara that the Pope used to wear, Paul VI gives that away. No more sedia gestatoria. The Pope used to go around on this old seat carried by a bunch of men with ostrich fans, cooling him off. That, all, that, all that pomp and circumstance gone. The administration of the church is streamlined. Well, I should say expanded. Some, when they t- tell you streamlining something, often it means that they add more staff and, and offices. So the bureaucracy of the Vatican is expanded, much more international, and that's a trend that will continue to the point where we will even have a foreign pope, by which I mean a Polish pope. No more index of forbidden books. The Holy Office of the Inquisition, ooh, whatever, any, that changes its name to something called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith which looks a lot better, you know, on your office door. So the general move is liberation. Liberation from a sense of shame and disgrace in some countries. Number two, the notion of dialogue, a conversation. Dialogue, 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 which is fine. I mean, I enjoy a good dialogue, but often there's a certain type who uses dialogue until you agree, and then there's no dialogue. Oh, we had that conversation already. Well, I'd like to read, no. The dialogue went the way I want. We're stopping there. There's a bit of that going on, particularly within religious houses. I'm thinking of the Jesuits, but others too. By the way, there's a great book. If you want to understand what happened to religious life after Vatican II, there's a book called The Reformed Jesuits by a Jesuit himself. He goes from 1930 to 1976. You can see how things changed and why with dates and names. There's also unbelievable euphoria. The bishops came home, and really, John the 23rd said, this is a new Pentecost of the church, which, by the way, was also said of Nicaea in 325, and could also be said of Trent in Vatican I. And another aspect of the church is kind of an invasion of experts, particularly in the field of psychology. Unfortunately, it was the psychology of the 1960s, and a lot of bishops trusted that, sometimes with very unfortunate results in all sorts of areas without getting into details. Now, let us talk about the hermeneutic. Well, now's a good time to look at my bibliography, because that is going to be the framework within which I talk about the different approaches to Vatican II. And some of these you will have heard, Also, it's going to give me an opportunity to just give you a bibliography in general. So let's share this screen. Okay, here's my History of Councils, a reader's bibliography. First, a general resource. I'll get to Vatican II in a minute, but this is my opportunity. This resource here is excellent. It's two volumes. Here's one of them. And what I like about this is that it has minimal historical introductions, but all the te- actual texts of the councils are here in the original languages, Latin, and Greek, Aramaic, Arabic, whatever you like, with English facing page translation. And I check, you know, the well-known passages that people debate about in terms of translation. And this one is always on the money. Other translations for Vatican II, Abbott and Flannery. If you have those, this great kindling, but you, I can't trust those translations, and yet they're the most commonly used translations by everyone. This there, Alberigo Tana, I haven't found anything to complain about in there, and I've tried. Next, handy general councils, the history of the council, as far as Vatican I. Well, the first one I show you there by Hubert Yedin is very easy to read. Here it is, very small and neat, just the facts with their significance by an eminent German historian of the councils. He's also an expert on Trent. So if you want to read the history of Trent in multi-volume, same author. And then here's another one that's pretty good for the councils also up to Vatican I, 
by Philip Hughes, a bit more detailed, and reads also very easily, gives you more details. It's kind of a nice read. Okay, now we have to go to Vatican II. Now, there are really, I suppose, three main hermeneutics, meaning ways of understanding Vatican II. And Benedict XVI exposed this very well. There's the hermeneutic of rupture. Vatican II is an event that brought about a new way of being church and nearly a new church. I'll talk, tell you about those. Number two, the hermeneutic of continuity. No, no, no. Vatican II is simply yet another council, and it hasn't changed anything. And if you read its texts, from the point of view of tradition, you'll see that there's really nothing new there. And then the her third hermeneutic is the hermeneutic of criticism says, Vatican II is a rupture and is no good. All right, so let's take a look at the books for a moment. Now, this one here by Alberigo and Comonchak for the English edition is simply called The History of Vatican II. Five volumes, 3,000 pages. Here's one of the volumes, here's volume one. So, five of these. The unavoidable resource to study this council. Although its analyses and its unwillingness to admit certain pertinent facts that they don't like, call for further reading on some details. If you have questions about that, I'll answer them in the question and answer period. It is the product of the so-called Bologna School, because there's a school in Bologna, in northern Italy, called the John XXIII Foundation of Religious Sciences, of which Alberigo, who died in 2007 or 8, I think, is the founder. And they're the ones who say Vatican II is an event. It is not the texts that count, but the very fact of addressing the modern world and then whatever followed. Next, Ralph Witchen, The Rhine Flows Into the Tibe is a classic. And you can read about that, but essentially he goes through the struggle between conservative and liberal. That's the analysis he has. And more recently, if you want to see a highly readable eyewitness account by a member of the Spirit of Vatican II generation, John O'Malley, performs that role to a T, even to the point of self-parody, I would say. Next, the hermeneutic of continuity. This one, Vatican II Renewal Within Tradition, you can see the title already, and that focuses on the texts. That's one of the big differences between hermeneutic of rupture or of event and hermeneutic of continuity. The hermeneutic of continuity really looks at the text very carefully. The hermeneutic event said, the text is not important. What is important is that there's this spirit that came down on earth and they gave us this new church. And then, if you want kind of an introduction to both sides, Richard John Newhouse, what really happened at Vatican II? And first Things, 2008 is online. And in this review article, Father Neuhaus contrasts O'Malley's, that's the spirit of Vatican II, and Lamb Leverings, that's continuity and tradition, books in favor of continuity. But I would also say, because you have to analyze the analyst, it is a classic instance of the optimistic school of continuity from the middle of Benedict XVI's pontificate. See, he wrote it in 2008. Then we have this, Agostino Marchetto, he's an archbishop. The Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, a counterpoint for the history of the council. And it's in counterpoint to what? To the school of Bologna, to the Alberigo, you know. And it represents what I think we can fairly say is the Vatican approved approach to Vatican II. In other words, this hermeneutic of continuity. In fact, the current Pope himself, Pope Francis, wrote to the author saying, I once told you, my dear Archbishop Marchetto, and I wish to repeat it today, that I consider you to be the best interpreter of the Second Vatican Council. That's the highest approval you can get in the church today when the Pope says, you interpret it right, and he's part of the school of continuity. More recently, for World on Fire fans, there's the Word on Fire Vatican II edition by Bishop Barron, and there's Levering again. And then the last book is the critical one. Roberto De Mattei, he's Italian, 
the Second Vatican Council, an unwritten story, two, uh, two, nearly 2,500 footnotes. And that's endorsed by Cardinal Brandmüller, the president emeritus of the Pontifical Committee for Historical Science. So my historian point of view, okay. And I'm only in the middle of reading it. I can't assess it, but it's super detailed and a little bit Italian and French centric in terms of the footnotes. So, but the point I'm trying to make with this bibliography, and I'll give it to Kelsey to put up for you, is that there, now we're in the post Vatican II era, and there are these two hermeneutics, or three, I should say, on how to approach it. And will this is interesting. George Weigel, you may have heard of him, said, We don't know yet. I'm paraphrasing. Whether Vatican II, in, you know, let's say a millennium from today, how will people like me and you, but in five centuries or in a thousand years, look back. Will Vatican II be more like Lateran V, a failed council of reform? Or will it turn out to have been another trend, the beginning of a great renewal and vigor of the church? George Weigel says, we'll have to wait and see. Well, all of us will be six foot under, but history alone will tell. And that already, I read the same sentiment written by a Peritus at the council in 1963, I think, or 64, Father Berthaud. He wrote to a friend saying, the time frame is different though, it will be up to historians of the 21st century to decide whether this is a great council after all. And I'm certainly the last per person to tell you which of the two it's going to be, but I do know it's very much the council under which we live. So now, to conclude our foray into all of the councils, I want to read to you from Hubert Yedin regarding councils in general. One permanent element is the cooperation of head and members of Christ's body, Pope and the rest of us, in the profession of a common faith and in the solution of the tasks which Christ laid upon the apostles and their successors, etc. Second paragraph. Yet, the assistance of the Holy Ghost, who, according to Catholic teaching, guarantees the decisions of a council to be free from error, does not dispense with the most strenuous efforts to arrive at the truth. On the contrary, it presupposes and demands such efforts, which means that where there's a council, there will be debates and discussions and tempers flaring up. And in the end, is the Holy Ghost who prevents these assemblies from defining as doctrine something that is false. And that is my talk. Thank you for your patience. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Papino. All right. So it looks like we have a number of questions coming in. And Shane, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, Shane. Hello. Is it time for another council? No. Well, yes. I don't know. <laughs> That, I mean, <laughs> that's after. I'll tell you what. Newhouse said during Benedict the Sixteenth Pontificate that although the okay, conciliarism calls for many councils, right? All the time, permanent parliament of bishops, and if why not, regular citizenry. But as Newhouse said, after the long pontificate of John Paul II, and then the pontificate of Benedict the Sixteenth and the bishops they picked and the seminarians we were getting at those days, the calls for a Vatican III on the part of the you know, strong reformers petered out. And I haven't really heard of a call. I mean, I remember in the 90s, you still heard some of these old uh, Vatican II generation priests say, oh, I can't wait for Vatican III. You don't really hear that anymore. Is it a time for a council? I really don't know. Would it take a council to fix things? I don't know that either. But good question, something to meditate about fantasize maybe, or to write a nightmare scenario about it, depending on your temperament. But I don't know. Right next. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pepino. This question is coming in from Carlos. Carlos asks, Dr. Pepino, some say that many of the primary documents produced by Vatican II were purposefully written in a vague fashion, more so than in previous councils. Is this true? And if so, to what end? Right. This is a very good question. And I, I am going to avoid conspiracy theories by simply mentioning plain facts that are incontrovertible. 
in, uh, and I'm going to speak only of Sacrosanctum Concilium because I happen to know about that document in this particular regard. When the Sacrosanctum Concilium was being composed by the anti-preparatory committee for the purpose, the secretary of it, whose name is uh, father at the time, Anibale Bonini, had a, a private meeting with some of the leadership in which he said, Let, be very careful not to say too much in the document, but only to lay the principles in embryo. And then after the councils, we'll be able to draw out the conclusions because we don't want to endanger even the most innocuous things by stating other things too bluntly. It's called the Bonini principle. The historian Yves Chiron brings it out. I can, I don't think I, I have it. I think I've given all my copies away, but we have all the minutes of the preparation of that particular document. And you can see there in print, the man saying, let's be very prudent in the way in which we write things now so we can draw the conclusions after the council. So there's no theory about that. Now, regarding the other documents, I really couldn't tell you. There's a famous quotation ascribed to Schillerbeck's along the same lines for theological things, but it turns out to be apocryphal. So again, rely only on texts and evidence. And if you have the evidence, then you can use it, which is what I just did. That sometimes there are rumors too, because people are trying to make sense of that. And God knows I have. Since I was young, what happened? What, what was going on? Um, and so make sure that you always rely directly on texts themselves, which is why, again, for the councils, this is, is the best. And you can always take the Latin or the Greek across the page to make sure that you're not being hoodwinked. That's my answer there. Great. Thank you. We have a question coming in from Mark, and he is asking, so we spoke about the um, infallibility with Vatican I. Mark is asking, how much of the of Vatican II of the 16 documents are considered infallible? Was it just those two dogmatic constitutions or some of the rest as well? Yes, that's a huge question. And what's interesting there is that there's a lot of fuzzy writing and fuzzy thinking about that, particularly because those who most want to extend infallibility at Vatican II are also those who least believe in infallibility in principle. So there's a tension there, if you see what I mean. And in the end, I, I don't think there's a doctrine in there. There's no, as far as I can tell, I may be wrong about this, okay? I'm a historian, not a theologian. I don't believe there's any infallibly defined new doctrine. A dogmatic constitution is not necessarily an infallible document. This having been said, it would be a very weak Catholicism indeed if we restricted the our assent to things declared infallibly. I mean, that would really restrict. I mean, there's plenty of good stuff there too. But um, and so there, there are things in Vatican II which call for obsequious obedience, obsequium they call it. Obsequious may not be the right English word. Uh, they call for assent and agreement, at least external lack of uh, preaching against what they say, as you know, because we're faithful Catholics. Unless after a lot of thought and prayer and uh, on good ground. So, I mean, there are things in there. So, for example, religious freedom. Okay, we haven't mentioned that. I mean, how much in dignitatis humanae exactly are we supposed to take in contradistinction to the teaching on religious freedom before the council? And men much more clever and, and uh, learned than I, and, and people of goodwill now, I'm not talking about subversives, still have not reached agreement on even that. So the answer I'm going to give you, I'm afraid, is going to be evasive, because I just don't see the thing here, just as you don't. And you and I are not alone in being a little bit in suspense here over that particular aspect. Yeah. Thank you. Maria, I see that you have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Papino. So, so my question is how we got from Vatican II to the Mass, like all the changes in the Mass, if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. And why is it that the current, um, like the suppression of the Mass, the Latin Mass, why is it being linked to Vatican II and signing on to Vatican II? Yes, very good question. Because indeed, the, huh, it, to, to speak very strictly, the Mass of Vatican II but if you look at newsreels of Vatican II, the mass is the mass 
of before the council. I mean, it's the old timey mass. Also, they use liturgies from all over the world. It must have been a great site. They use the Coptic, this, and the Slavonic, that. Now, the new mass was elaborated from 1964 to 1969 in its original Latin form, and then entered into vigor the first Sunday of Advent of 1969. Now, there are several questions embedded in your question. Number one, can it be said that the Mass as promulgated in 1969 is in fact the Mass required by the document on the Liturgy of Vatican II, right? Now, those who say that to reject or to refuse the new Mass is to refuse Vatican II clearly conflict the two. For them, it's Vatican II and the new Mass are part of the same thing. There are those, who, and then there are other schools of thought too. There are those who will tell, there's one whom I heard with my own ears, uh, Dom Alcuin Reed, he's a Benedictine scholar of the liturgy. He calls the Mass of 1969 the mutant offspring of, Sacra, Sac, of, of Vatican II. In other words, it is the offspring of Vatican II, but some mutation occurred along the way. And that depends on your hermeneutic, number one, and what you think the text says. And what, who is to determine what the text says? Well, you might say, well, the people who wrote it know best what it says. Well, that's going back. The people who wrote it are also the people who wrote the new mass, in which case, well, okay, yes. But you might also say, well, no, the bishops voted for a literal interpretation of this text. And this is gonna sound, sound a little bit to those of you who are citizens of the US, like discussions over the originalist uh, interpretation of the constitution, right? versus a living constitution. You find, and uh, although there are differences in principles on an intellectual level here, it is my conviction that it has a lot to do also with the temperament of the individual, the way he's going to go. Okay, the biases born of temperament will push you into one way or the other without denying you know, free will and intelligence and things. And so, number one, and number two, Everyone, to one degree or another, did experience the Vatican II Council as an event into which can be folded all of the things that happened in the decade that followed it, right? So one might say a young novice in, an, in a convent who wants to wear a starched wimple is rejecting Vatican II, you see? Or even, and, and here I'm going to be even more perverse, the young couple that does not use contraception refuses Vatican II. You could even go, I mean, rhetorically, one could even go that far, wrongly, I think. Uh, simply because at Vatican II, number one, nothing was said about contraception, certainly not about the pill. And there, was, there were at least three, if not more bishops who at Vatican II openly, well, everyone understood what they were saying, were in favor of the use of contraception. And no one said boo for three years until Paul VI published Humanae Vitae in 68. So you could be forgiven for believing that Vatican II admitted contraception. Certainly, many confessors believed this, as well as did the married women whose confessions they heard. And that's how that happened, you see. So here we have the question. Your question goes to the root of how much of this thing, the council, and all the, the para council, all that comes, the things that were promulgated after it, how much is all of that Vatican II? It, are we going to limit it just to the text on the page? Or are we going to say that the reforms that follow the council belong to it? And throughout the pontificate of Paul VI and John Paul II, the common notion was no, these reforms, as long as they're promulgated by the church, appropriate authority, particularly the Pope himself, those are all part of Vatican II. And to reject them, is to reject Vatican II. And that is the math that's going on in the heads of those who say that to reject the new mass is to reject Vatican II. And there's a sense in which that is a correct position. But, it, from the, but Alcuin Reed would say, no, no, no. I don't know what to think myself, Maria, because after all, Paul VI promulgated the new mass. I mean, he's the supreme authority. He's the one who confirmed Sacrosanctum Concilium. And I would further add that although the document of Vatican II says that Latin should be retained and Gregorian chant should have pride of place, yet the supreme legislator, the Pope himself, said the day he promulgated the new mass, we say goodbye to Latin and Gregorian chant. 
So what are we going to make of that, Marie? I'll leave it in your hands. Thank you, Dr. Pepino. Julia, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Back when I was young, doctor, I remember seeing the triple tiara on TV worn by Pope Paul VI. I know that's on display in the Basilica of Washington, D.C. So what's the significance of the triple tiara and will future Pope wear it and what will be the significance of that? I oh, right. OK, yes. Thank you. That's a very small point, but a good one. It, it goes back to the days of the medieval popes and in the day when the popes saw themselves as having temporal power over the kings of Christendom. And so that's what the crowns mean. They, mean, they, they represent different kinds of jurisdiction. And uh, I know there's one television series about a, a fictional pope in the future who has it sent back from, from Rome. It was kind of an amusing wink to that particular event. Now, if I may, I haven't heard anything, anyone talk about religious life. I do want to read a passage from this book just to give you a feel. Okay. 1967. And this is a various nuns writing about the implementation of Vatican II in their convents. This one is in the chapter in on nuns in ordinary clothes. It's just to get the spirit, okay, the vibe. A theologian author, internationally known expert, exclaimed his approval regarding not wearing habits or wear, you know, taking off the veil, saying, you belong to the 22nd century. Now, remember, Star Trek was on TV in those days, okay? That's kind of what's going on through people's minds. You belong to the 22nd century. Wonderful. Build buildings quickly because young women will storm your novitiate. That was the mood in 67. Okay. Need we they say really the believe. exact opposite happened? <laughs> the difference between hope and reality could not be more stark. So that's the ambiance of those days, which is why, I mean, when you see members of, the, of that generation, fewer and fewer now, they're wearing a scowl and they look unhappy. It didn't quite turn out the way they had hoped. And then when they see seminarians filled with young men in cassocks, or they see novitiates in orders that are more traditional, filled with young, happy, smiling young people, young women, young men, they, it's very hard for them emotionally. And so uh, I think in charity, we have to be kind to them. And my hope is that the last survivors of this generation as they're being nursed in their nursing homes will be attended to by these joyful young sisters that we see in traditional orders today. And hopefully they'll be able to return to that joy before you know they go on to their reward. Amen, thank you, Dr. Fabino. And thank you everyone for staying with us this evening and through these three parts of Dr. Pepino's series. If you enjoyed this series, I highly recommend that you share it with your friends and family. Please help us spread the word about the Institute of Catholic Culture. Please also keep our mission in your prayers. And on that note, Dr. Pepino, if you can close us in prayer this evening. Certainly. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen, and God bless everyone. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.